World Affairs Roundup, next on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs at UWM and Milwaukee Public Television present International Focus, a global magazine linking Wisconsin and the world. Welcome to International Focus. I'm Doug Savage from the Institute of World Affairs at UWM with another edition of our World Affairs Roundup. Today we'll be looking at Simmering Syria. In the face of an increasingly bloody government crackdown, Syrian opposition groups are beginning to call openly for regime change. How does this conflict compare to Libya, and what, if anything, should be the U.S. role there? Pals in Palestine. Leaders of rival Palestinian groups Fatah and Hamas have agreed to form an interim government and set a date for elections. Will Palestinian unity breathe life into talks with Israel or pull the proverbial plug? Elder statesmen. Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter and other members of the so-called Elders Group were in Pyongyang and Seoul this week to jumpstart talks between North Korea and South Korea. Did they accomplish anything, or was their effort simply Korean kibitzing? Out with the old and in with the old. Cuba's Communist Party Congress formally appointed Raul Castro, age 79, as party secretary, tapping 80-year-old veteran revolutionary Jose Ramon Machado as numero dos. Is the regime simply treading water, or can Cuba's gerontocracy bring genuine reform to the island? To help us explore these issues, and to tell us what they wore to the royal wedding, we're joined as usual by John Kotska, a retired U.S. Foreign Service officer who has conducted public diplomacy for the Department of State on four continents. Anne Hamilton, political scientist and coordinator of international studies at UW-Whitewater, who also served in the U.S. Foreign Service. And Robert Craig, author of a number of articles and books dealing with the history and politics of American foreign policy. He currently serves as Executive Director of Citizen Action of Wisconsin. Welcome, everyone, as always. We'd like to start with Syria. First of all, John, maybe you could tell us, where, where are we uh, in this ongoing saga of, uh, of revolt and potential regime change? You know, as, as I was looking at your question about whether what Syria is, what's happening in Syria, and what is the relationship to Libya, I was thinking of some kind of a construct to look at the region. And, and if, if our viewers would just kind of put this in front of them every time they look at one of these uprisings or, or at the Middle East in general, whether the country is dominated by Sunnis or Shia, whether or not uh, there is an Islamic regime or a secular regime. An example of the Islamic would be uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, and secular would be Syria and the Gulf states. Very different, but secular in that regard. And whether or not they're oil producing or not, because that, makes, that adds a different dynamic to this thing. And what are the relationships with Israel? Uh, Egypt right now is going through an interesting changes. We'll get into the discussion on the Palestinians. But if you put this construct in front of you, you'll see that, like, for example, on the Shia, uh, the Shia are a majority in Bahrain, but we're treating that one very differently because there's important oil interests there as well as military concerns, where Syria is dominated by Sunnis, uh, but it's a secular state, and we're putting much more pressure on this. The Arabs themselves look at these things differently as well. Uh, and then there's, that's one more construct, the Arabs versus the Persians in this regard. Uh, the ability of the Shia to identify with, with Iran is complicated through that prism of being Arab versus uh, Persian. So, Anne, if we uh, use, use John's formulation and, and just uh, look at the headlines. What, what's going on? Where are we in, in sort of the tipping point? Well, there have been um, about 500 deaths uh, at the hands of the government in the last few weeks with the government bringing out troops onto the street and indiscriminately shooting at civilians. Uh, as a result, there have been calls by the international community in a situation that looks somewhat like the lead-up to Libya, with Europe taking the lead, um, calling for action by the UN, um, the United States 
talking about sanctions, but it seems lagging a little bit behind. But there are tremendous differences between Libya and um, Syria, uh, including geopolitical differences in terms of their relationship to the other states of the region, and also um, some very physical constraints in terms of the geography of the area. It's, it's landlocked. There isn't a territory, as in Libya, where part of the country was actually under the rebels already, so that it made some sense. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the speech that President Obama gave um, about the situation in Libya, where he anticipated the criticism that um, if we do it here, we have to do it everywhere. And he made the point that this is a particular situation in a particular country, and that um, we, we are going in here now because we can. But the circumstances in Libya came together in a way that they will not come together in Syria. There was Arab backing, an international coalition. Some of them might come together, but probably not all four. So it's, it's much harder to think about international intervention in this particular case. Well, Robert, Senator Kyle from Arizona has been uh, making some, some rather forceful statements about, you know, here we have another totalitarian regime openly abusing its citizens and it would seem to suggest all the same criteria are there. I mean, what, what uh, is different from a, a policy standpoint? Well, I would never want to accuse a U.S. setter of posturing, but on the other hand, <laughs> I can see John likes that. Uh, it's, it's an easy shot to take, right? Because I think in Libya, as Anne was talking about, uh, things were aligned where it looks like there was going to be a massacre in a major city and air, for, and air power could knock it out and part of the country is already controlled by the opposition. And there's not such a clear situation in Syria in terms of military force making a difference in preventing a massacre, even though there's horrendous killing going on, which is reprehensible. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also a more complicated situation. Syria um, is a country that's uh, been tied to Iran, which Senator Kyle pointed out. Uh, the Obama administration has tried very hard to detach them from Iran, has had a whole strategy that has led to the ambassador being sent back uh, to Damascus, and uh, that would undermine this strategy to suddenly become aggressive, which is one reason we've been um, rather passive. Another reason is, is because Israel actually has come to conclusion that the devil they know is better than the devil they don't, and therefore, despite the long animosity with Syria, actually sees it as stabilizing influence uh, right now. But on the other hand, a lot of analysts now tend to think that the um, Assad regime will not last that long. It might be weeks, it might be months, but that it cannot tolerate over, to, over time this, these kind of protests, uh, uh, development of an Arab Spring movement in their country, and that there are already rumors of various elites potentially quietly detaching themselves from the regime. Uh, so you have a very serious situation. It's also impacted by the fact that Egypt has changed and has a very different position in the region than before, which is affecting, as we're going to talk about later, uh, the situation in, in, uh, with, in Palestine. And so it it's a very complicated situation, but foreign policy, as John and Ann like to say, uh, is much more comp too more complicated to have this clear line rule where whenever there is a human rights violation, we're going to intervene militarily or we're not. There's always going to be a whole lot of contingent factors, where the Arab League is, where Europe is, a whole lot of other considerations. And so the Syrian situation is much harder to untangle in many ways than the Libyan for that reason. But the other thing we should also point out is that the, the mission creep is already into the Libyan experience. We're now sending drones in. We're training mm -hmm. people on the ground. Uh, this, this was clearly a president who was not interested in getting in there, and his hand was called by both our allies and, the, uh, and some members of his staff uh, who pressured heavily to get involved because of human rights considerations. We don't have a plan in, in Libya, mm -hmm. and I don't think we have a plan for Syria yet. So that said, up to this point, are we getting it right in Syria? Well, I think it's interesting that the United States chose to refer the, the situation to the UN Human Rights Council instead of to the Security Council, where it can sort of simmer back there for a while. Um, I, I think John's right. We don't know what to do, so it's better that we don't stick our necks out too much at this point. Well, let's move on to uh, another situation where we've actually got rapprochement rather than war. Uh, Robert, in, in Palestine, two erstwhile foes have agreed to form an interim government. Uh, tell us a little bit of what's going on there. 
Well, we, uh, Hamas and Fatah, seem to have come together, though there have been actual agreements signed and had not followed through on before. It's a tentative agreement. It was brokered by Egypt. So immediately we have a change in the orientation of, of Egypt and is not as strongly on the side of the U.S. and Israeli foreign policy as before. And so it, it, it's interesting because you have a lot of saber rattling from Israel, from Netanyahu, saying that you have to choose if you're Fatah between Hamas and Israel, though it's pretty hard to, to say that there was actual progress on peace or that, uh, that Fatah had much to bargain with, uh, with uh, Likud in Israel. And so it actually puts, if it goes through and forward, a lot more pressure on the situation because... Hamas has not agreed to the uh, to, to the quartet principles like like recognizing Israel, for example, uh, renouncing violence, and uh, and so. But at the same time, if we have Palestinian unity, they want to make a play, and there's a process in place to become a state, uh, independent of whether there is a peace deal with Israel or not. September so, vote at the UN on this mm -hmm. subject. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it changes the dynamic since the dynamic was not leading to peace in the first place. I don't think a change in dynamic is a bad thing right now. We, it, things need to be changed up. But ultimately, Israel has to decide whether it's serious about peace. I think that the situation will eventually deteriorate and get much worse than it is now if this if this sort of uh, if this situation continues, where you have grinding poverty and uh, lack of hope in, in the Palestine in the Palestinian territories. Well, you know, and I think most people would. Uh would agree that Syria was more or less an ally of Hamas, and Egypt certainly was an ally of Fatah. I mean, how does this this sort of Arab Spring scenario play into this situation? Well, I think this this is very complicated. Uh, first of all, Hamas is still identified by the U.S. and the EU as a terrorist organization. Uh, how th this comes into a statehood? Uh, is for us and for the Israelis is very complicated. I'm not sure if the Europeans will have as much trouble with it as we might have. Uh, and and we're, remember, we're, we're heading into elections. So, <laughs> and so positions are going to be laid out there. Mm -hmm. and, and talk a little bit, Anne, about uh, the September vote in, uh, in the UN. Well, uh, they've been pushing for a while to have a vote in the General Assembly. Um, uh, the, in, in, which is from September to December, um, to recognize Palestine as a state. Um, Abbas was going to go ahead and do it with or without Hamas because they have been making preparations for sort of the administrative security side of a state on the West Bank. And so it's interesting because Hamas had refused to enter into this type of agreement I think as late as February, and now uh, they've changed their tune. And it, because you know now they're a little bit worried about Syria's support for them, given what's happening in Syria, and they see a more friendly um, mediator in Egypt. Um, and Abbas is a little nervous too because he doesn't have the full support of Egypt. So it's really an interesting dance that's going on. But this this resolution in the General Assembly would just be another. It's symbolic because they don't carry legal weight, but it would be the force of the international community. At least those countries that voted for it, sort of, sort of saying, "Yes, we think you're ready." Well, we'll have to keep an eye on that one. Uh, First, we'll take a short break, and we'll come back with more World Affairs Roundup on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa. .uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus and our World Affairs Roundup. Well, John, now uh, I'd like to move to another part of the world and the visit by the elders to the Korean Peninsula. Tell us a little bit about that mission. Well, the idea of the elders comes out of a African construct. Uh, in Africa, elders in a village are often turned to for guidance, wisdom in terms of how to handle the affairs of the village. Uh, generally, it's when things start to break down. This concept developed with a certain amount of money from some, some 
interested parties. And it, it kind of found its way through Africa with Nelson Mandela kind of being in the lead. But to be very honest, the, this is not very important. Uh, these, are, these are former presidents of very minor countries in Europe. Well, tell us a little bit about the mission itself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, they're, on a f they're, they're there to try and find a way past an impasse. They being who? Okay, Mary Robinson of, the, of Ireland and uh, uh, Gro Brundtland of uh, Norway and Marty Ar uh, Antesari of Finland and our own Jimmy Carter. Uh, who, who fr from the United States, <laughs> uh, and they've been there for a few days now. Apparently, they're on their way out, and there has been criticism that Carter has levied at the United States and South Korea because of the lack of humanitarian assistance for the North. But I think this is a good point to start talking about North Korea, um, but it's not important to the process. The Chinese are talking to the South Koreans right now. And uh, we and the South Koreans are starting to talk in terms of what next. And there's apparently uh, some back-channel discussions between us and the North. And the logical way in which this starts is that the South Korea and North Korea have some talks. And then we will have talks with North Korea. And then we go back to the six-party talks. Well, and... Uh like John, you were once a, a professional diplomat yourself. What is your take on the sort of citizen diplomacy at this level? Well, I think it's, it's, I know that this kind of thing happens a lot, particularly more so in, in the days of globalization, where you have multiple layers of interactions um, across uh, the world. But I think that it's, it's a complicating factor in the sense that, for example, when Jimmy Carter was in uh, North Korea, I think yesterday or earlier this week, he was handed a note by a senior individual in the um, North Korean government, but not Kim Jong-il, saying that Kim Jong-il stood ready to meet with anyone, North, um, the United States and South Korea without pre preconditions at any time, you know, which, which Jimmy Carter then came and announced. Um, he also came and announced that there are people starving, they're, they're, they are being treated like dogs in North Korea, but blamed the U.S. government for this and the South uh, Korean government, which is rather extraordinary given that to, to cast the blame because we withdrew food aid because we thought it was being poorly used as opposed to saying anything about the North Korean government. So I think it's, it's not a terrible problem in sense of the higher levels of diplomacy at all. It's just a nuisance. And it makes you wonder what their motivations are. Well, Robert, what about that? What, what do you think are their motivations? Are they just seniors with too much time on their hands? Or? <laughs> well, I'm surprised John is not more of a fan of elder diplomacy. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Resembling that remark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, it, it, it's kind of funny to read the press coverage. It's like some, you can imagine them being a group of superheroes getting the call on the red phone to go <laughs> deal with a particular <laughs> crisis. Um, I don't think it hurts. I mean, it does create a forum where the, the countries involved can make statements that might be useful in actual official diplomacy. The uh, figures involved have a certain amount of moral authority, so I think it, 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 add, it may add something to the debate or detract it based on, what, on, what, on one's perspective on a particular utterance. But I don't think, um, since I believe that there ought to be ethics and values in foreign policy, that it's a bad thing overall to have a, a group of people who have stature trying to go and, and uh, be helpful in some way in, uh, in major international disputes and controversies. It doesn't mean it, it's a silver bullet or will help in every instance. It probably would be very hard for it to make, have much benefit in North Korea. But I think it's a worthy effort and that we, shouldn't, we, we don't need to throw cold water on it. Not that, that you are, but... Um, <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> okay. But, and it, you know, and, and it suggests that there's a moral force. I like the idea of statesmanship coming back. We haven't had much statesmanship in the last half century or so. Well, I wasn't so down on it till I yeah. heard Jimmy Carter coming out yeah. and saying, you know, so I, I don't know. There's, there's a connection, though, with North Korea that I think we should share with our viewers, and that's the connection to Libya. Uh, you know, Libya willingly gave up its nuclear weapons. And, uh, and now it's been invaded. Uh, 
this lesson for a very single-minded North Korean regime uh, would say, why in the world would we give up our nuclear weapons and take away that one, that one vehicle we have to make sure we don't get invaded? Well, the, uh, the risk of uh, putting an ageist cast to the show, our <laughs> next topic is the, uh, the Cuba Communist Party conference in which the the torch was passed from, uh, formerly from Fidel to his brother Raul as first secretary. And uh, the second secretary was an, an equally, shall we say, experienced gentleman to uh, <laughs> preside over the, the next several years. So is this significant at all? I mean, in, in terms of what didn't happen, Anne? I mean, uh, I think some people saw this as, as a possibility that sort of the, a new guard might take place. And that's certainly not what we've seen. Well, Raul Castro had announced that he was going to um, re bring in a lot of young people into leadership positions, and that didn't really happen, although they do have a plan to try and, and um, get more people prepared to come into leadership positions. Um, and it, it's interesting, though, because the rhetoric in his speech was, it, it was, it was, a combination of, um, it sounded that sometimes like Gorbachev and sometimes like he wished that he was Deng Xiaoping, but he sounded more like Gorbachev in the speech, in that he kept saying he wanted to just modernize but keep all the elements of socialism, and yet they're trying to introduce some, some capitalist-like reforms, such as allowing people to sell private property, for example, which is pretty, pretty significant. Well, and he said um, in his speech, pointedly and specifically that one of his tasks was to ensure that capitalism never right, returned to the right, island. That's so it? interesting. Um, and yeah, right, and to, to ensure that they keep true to their revolutionary that's ideals. That's why you have both sides of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really a lot of um, double talk. But I think that the fact that he appointed the two older people, as you said in your lead, is, is very highly significant. So, Robert, what about the sort of context economically for all of this? I mean, why even talk to re about reform? Well, I mean, they're still facing an embargo, and there, there's a question of whether or not their economy is viable and, their, and their whole, the whole state structure they've created. So it is like Gorbachev, I agree, though the other parts of the presentation and the speeches uh, harken back to uh, the Bay of Pigs and uh, the 1950s. It was a little bit of a time warp, right, or, or reunion. Uh, I mean, who, who knows whether just a, 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 a partial loosening, allowing people not just to trade houses and cars, but to buy them outright, mm -hmm. uh, would make a big difference. They're going to Which wait. was one of the reforms that came out of this, mm -hmm. right? Now, yeah, previously, they, they go, you, you couldn't buy and sell a home. But they're going to lay can. off huge numbers of public employees, which is the major economy they have is public employment. So it's hard to see how this private sector would build up. They're talking about all this arable land that's not being tilled and talking about going out and farming it. It sounds kind of like 19th century American, you know, uh, uh, policy of uh, filling the frontiers. So I don't know whether it's economically viable, but it, it is kind of amusing that some of the younger, young blood they've talked about bringing in, it would be AARP eligible in this country. So <laughs> that, that's the, the context as far as, you know. <laughs> Just to remind Rob, Robert, he may be young, but you'll get over that. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, what about uh, this idea of uh, sort of two systems, kind of a, a Chinese model for Cuba? I mean, is this anything you've seen in, in what came out of this party congress look at all like the Chinese experiment? Uh, a little bit like that, a little bit. I, but I, it, it really, as you look at it, it, it seems incohesive. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. it's hard to get your hands around it and come up with a model that it, it sounds like it's a work in progress that maybe in five years we'll come together again and, and see some more dimension of it. I'm more interested in seeing and hearing what the Cuban community in Florida has to say about this. And I haven't heard anything so far about whether or not this is changing the way in which they're looking at events there, because that has a big impact mm -hmm. on how we as a government look at this. Well, and, and what about that? I mean, is there anything in, in any of this that would likely influence U.S. policy towards Cuba? I don't think so in the sense that I think we're just waiting for them to die. I mean, to be quite <laughs> blunt, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that has to happen relatively soon, one would think. And, um, and then there will be major change. Um, and it seems, it seems that 
that we're just waiting that out. I mean, you know, playing around the edges, but anticipating that there will be major change soon, and that's when we can review our policies. And it is a testament to socialized medicine that they have uh, gone on so long. And in <laughs> fact, if they had Paul Ryan's health care, they might have actually <laughs> gone away much more quickly. <laughs> there, there is no shame. He has no, no opportunity that some people won't use. <laughs> well, I think on that note, we will uh, say thank you to our panelists, John Kotzka and Hamilton. Robert Craig, to our viewers, we'll see you again on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 